Now when we get up next to our edges and corners, we'll apply our glaze. And I like to take the brush and run it right along the edge, spreading the glaze into those areas. Then I take the woolly, and I actually push it in those areas so that we end up with a nice professional looking edge line. Jabbing through. This is really a remarkably fast technique. It looks fantastic in a room. It gives a very Tuscan look, which is so popular. I think it's a very elegant and rich look. Now I'm ready to continue on loading up my paint roller and continuing on in another three foot by three foot area. Rolling back and forth again, making sure that just my base coat co is covered, not worrying too much about what my end result looks like until after I've covered my base coat. Okay, now I'm going to fine tune it again. If you'll notice one thing that I happen to like about this look is that you get what's called color movement. That's when the colors make large spans on the wall. You see like this? See how the light color kind of weaves in and out? That's a fantastic look in a room. Again, finishing up my edging as I'm going on. It just doesn't get any easier than this. So I'm going to go ahead and continue painting the wall. Same brush, dip it into my next color, and apply more splotches. It's pretty hard to screw this one up, but if you are going to make a mistake, again, the biggest mistake that you're going to make is not applying enough paint to the surface where you actually see drips. It's kind of a strange concept at first if you've never done this technique before. Now watch closely. The paint actually begins to drip on the wall. So again, once my paint's on the surface, take the brush, spread the paint out. There's no magic or special talent required. If you find yourself along your edges or corners or ceiling lines, run your brush along there and spread it out. Now here's an area that we're we've already blended this area and we want to get the adjoining area to make a nice smooth transition. So you spread the paint out across that area where one area stops and starts. Then you're going to take the woolly and stipple it down so that it makes a nice transition.
like so. This way, you get professional looking results. You can't really see where you started and stopped. Now if you'll notice the edge, that snuggles right up into next to our edges and corners and ceiling lines. So we don't need to take other little tools to fit along these areas. We're ready now to do the marble veining using the marble veining feather, which is basically a turkey feather. Now what's interesting about this is we've got this whole big feather, but the only part we're actually going to use is the very tip. I'm going to dip it into my paint water mixture, wipe off the excess. I'm going to use the tip of the feather to basically draw a marble vein on the wall, like so. Now one thing that you do want to do is if you notice I'm jagging it to create the line here. What a common mistake is, is Often people just pull it and make kind of a, I call it the shoelace effect, where it looks like this. You don't want that type of effect. You want it very jagged, like it's just cut through marble or granite. Twist it and turn it as you're dragging. Now if you notice I'm shaking a lot as I'm doing it, you want to do that if it's helpful for you, a lot of people use their left hand if they're right-handed or use their right hand if they're left-handed to create the marble veins. They also can go in any particular direction that you want them to go. Now notice here I've kind of followed the background layout that we've uh, done. But this here, I'm actually going to just cut it right across where it connects up. Load up your roller with the glaze. Begin by rolling it from top to bottom. When you apply the glaze with the roller, apply it a little bit wider than the width of the woolly so that you've got an edge there that's kind of open. Then again, take the woolly and allowing it to overlap where you previously had done your dragging and drag it through. And take the woolly. And I'm actually going to apply my glaze in a horizontal pattern. Again, being conscious that our glaze is going on nice and even and smooth. And we want to apply it in a wide enough area, wider than the woolly. Then we're going to go ahead and take the woolly, and it's okay if you work left to right or right to left, whatever you're comfortable with. And you're going to drag through the woolly. Now you might create some wavering as you travel across the surface. But that's okay because linen and denim weaves actually do have a waver to them. When you get to the end, again, you take the woolly, wipe off the excess glaze, and continue on. Now Amber is going to go ahead and add more glaze, and I'm just going to follow behind her. It goes really quickly. I'm taking the harsh line and tapping it away down to nothing. If you'll notice when I'm doing this, I don't need to rotate the woolly because it really doesn't leave an impression. It also doesn't matter if I hit it hard or light, assuming that light is probably a better idea. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is an extremely subtle technique, and it is very elegant. But because I'm sure it's very difficult to see on camera, we're going to zoom you in so you get to see what it really looks like up close. 
See how the blaze gets broken through the color and you can see the little jabs. That's what stippling should look like. Now, as we begin building the, the clouds up, that's when they really start coming to life. Now that's why I started at the top portion, because I like to overlap them right directly on top of each other. And this is done by applying again your white glaze and then a little bit of your gray glaze, taking the little woolly, tapping and jabbing, mixing in the gray, and spreading them out. Again, building them up. And I tend to do them a little bit more in clusters than kind of randomly individual clouds. Sometimes I'll do two together, sometimes I'll do three together, and occasionally I'll do one large one. Now this is really a very easy process. Just don't overthink it or overwork it. Just blend it out because when it really comes to life, again as I said before, is after you build them up and stand, it, stand back and take in the whole picture. Once she's done a few rows of applying the glaze, then I'm ready to follow behind her using my cotton rag. So in order to get a proper impression on the wall, the best way to do it is folding the cotton rag properly. The best way to do this is to hold it up, grab it by one corner, and reach your hand down below and kind of let it fold back and forth across your hand into a ball. That way, the folds that you see left will leave the impression of the rag painting on the surface. So every time you refold the rag, you'll have a different impression. So I'm going to go ahead and hold on to this and start removing the glaze. I'm going to take my hand and begin by making an impression on the surface. Then I'm going to make sure that I'm rotating. Notice my hand is going right to left, right to left back and forth so that I have a rotational viewpoint on the wall. And at any given point, if your rag becomes overly saturated with paint, refold it. And you can keep doing this until your rag is completely saturated and you can use a new rag at that point. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm rotating quickly back and forth. It's kind of more of a pouncing effect. Refolding. back and forth, creating my look. Now I'm going to go ahead and finish up with the rag roller. Now what I like to do before I begin is fluff it up so I've got nice folds going all the way around. Then I'm going to go ahead and take it to the surface and just begin by rolling through like so. You can create an X pattern or a V pattern, just rolling back and forth. Now when you first make your impression on the wall, you'll get a really crisp look, a very defined rag painting look. Now this may be the look that you're after. If you're looking for a more subtle look, you can roll it more to create a more modeled or muted rag painting effect. Now a common question that people have is, won't the rag roller become saturated with glaze on the surface as you're working down the wall. And it will to a certain extent. It won't become overly saturated, but there will be a point in time where you want to download some of the glaze. The best way to do that is to take it to a cotton rag or paper towels, preferably a cotton rag that is lint free, and you're going to go ahead and download some of that glaze. Amber's applying her base coat of glaze on the surface and she's paying close attention to get it on relatively evenly. She's going to do a, a reasonable area so that I'm able to follow along rapidly behind her. Now I have my sponge and I'm ready to begin removing the glaze and cutting into it to create my look. So I begin tapping and I have a cotton cloth here, and I'm going to use that to actually blot off any extra glaze that I get on 
my sponge. We're using the sponge roller. Now if you look closely at my sponge roller, it's got big chunks missing out from it. The reason why is this creates the variation. You should take the sponge roller and pull pieces out to create a random pattern, which is desirable on the wall surface when you're painting. Now when she does apply this, she wants to stay a couple of columns ahead of me so that the glaze does not have an opportunity to dry before I can create the faux finish on the wall. Now while Julie's going ahead and applying more glaze to her roller, I'm going to take my sponge roller and create a pattern by rolling through and cutting through the glaze. I'm going to roll back and forth to create the look. Keep in mind the more you roll, the softer the look will become. So if you're looking for a real muted look, you'll roll it more. If you want it more jagged and textured, you'll roll it less. When your sponge roller does get saturated with glaze, you don't need to wash it out. Just simply take it to a soft cotton cloth, preferably lint-free, and download some of that glaze. I'm wiping off the excess on the side of the tray, leaving a small amount of texture on the Milano plaster tool. And it goes on very easily. You really don't need to apply a lot of pressure. Now once you've applied it to the surface, you can leave it like this, and many people do, or you can take the side, there's a flat side to the Milano plaster tool, and you can actually take that flat side, tip the Milano plaster tool on its side, and actually knock down the excess. That'll give you more of a kind of a knockdown look with your Milano plaster look. 